Good evening, everyone. I'm Daniel Green, president of the Newberry Library. Thank you for joining us for today's Meet the Author program with Laura Edwards for her new book, Only the Clothes on Her Back, Clothing and the Hidden History of Power in the 19th Century United States. This book was published earlier this month by Oxford University Press, and tonight Laura will be in conversation with Margaret Story. The Newberry Library supports and inspires research, teaching, and learning in the humanities. We connect researchers and visitors with our collection in our reading rooms, exhibition galleries, program spaces, classrooms, and online digital resources. In all Newberry, Newberry activities, we strive to bring together communities of scholars, students, and the public to discuss ideas that matter in our world today. The Newberry reading rooms and exhibition galleries are free and open to visitors every Tuesday through Saturday. Visit Newberry.org to learn more about our collections and exhibitions, our many digital resources, online classes, and our virtual and in-person public programs. I also encourage you to follow the Newberry on social media for more opportunities to engage with our collection, our staff, and stories that bridge the past and the present. During this evening's program, please enter questions in the Q&A feature if you're watching on Zoom or in the comments section if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube. And our speakers will take some questions near the end of the hour. It's my pleasure now to introduce tonight's speakers, both of whom have deep connections to the Newberry Library. Laura and Margaret, if you wanna join us. Laura F. Edwards is the class of 1921 Bicentennial Professor in the History of American Law and Liberty at Princeton University. Professor Edwards is the author of four previous books that explore legal history, political culture, and gender during the Civil War and post-Civil War period. She's received awards for her publications from the Southern Historical Association and the American Historical Association, as well as fellowships from the American Council of Learned and Societies, the American Bar Foundation, the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the National Humanities Center, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Smithsonian Institution. Laura has held multiple fellowships at the Newberry, her latest in 2019-2020, when she was working on this new book, Only the Clothes on Her Back. Before she wrote any of those books, while she was a graduate student, Laura was a Newberry staff member in what was then called the Family and Community History Center. And Laura's returned to the Newberry often since then, finding many ways to give back to the community of scholars here. In recent years, she's helped reinvigorate a vibrant network of Newberry fellows, and I'm particularly grateful for her help with that. Congratulations on your new book, Laura, and thank you for the many ways that you champion the Newberry. Margaret Story is Professor of History and the Associate Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences at DePaul University. She's the author of Loyalty and Loss, Alabama's Unionists in the Civil War and Reconstruction, the editor of Tried Men and True or Union Life in Dixie, and the co-author with Nicholas Proctor of Kentucky 1861, Loyalty, State and Nation. She's also the co-curator of the online exhibition, The Civil War in Art, Teaching and Learning Through Chicago Collections. I've had the opportunity to teach alongside Margaret many times in a professional development program for school teachers at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I can say from that experience that Margaret is among the most dynamic creative teachers that I've ever known. She's taken that dedication to her work at DePaul where she's currently leading a new in initiative known as the Experiential Humanities Collaborative. This project, which is funded by the Mellon Foundation, seeks to foster meaningful social impact through experiential engagement in higher education and the wider community. But I'd like to think that Margaret's successes all stem back to her experiences at the Newberry as well. When Margaret was an undergraduate student at McAllister College, she participated in the Newberry's Associated Colleges of the Midwest Seminar, which is an intensive semester long class for undergraduates that the Newberry has been hosting for more than 55 years. I believe Margaret may have first met Laura at, that, at the Newberry then when Margaret was a college student and Laura was a graduate student. So I'm so pleased that we could bring them back together as professors and teachers who are shaping their fields today. So now I will hand things over to Professor Edwards and Professor Story. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you, Danny. That was a lovely introduction. Yes, I was uh, Laura's work study student all those years ago. So it's a little bit of old home week for us and my great pleasure and honor to be able to uh, speak with you about this book today, Laura. Um, 
it's a fantastic book. I can't recommend it highly enough for everybody in the audience who haven't got a copy yet to go out and get one. Um, but I think the best thing to do first is just to start with you telling us a little bit about what the book's about. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Um, and it's so nice. It is Old Home Week. It's, um, I, I look at you now and it's like, oh my gosh, I knew you when you were like, so, and I also just want to thank the Newberry. I don't, Newberry has been with me through every stage of my career from graduate student to now, and I couldn't have done these projects without the Newberry. So um, I'm very grateful to that. Um, so the book, yes, the book is a legal history of textiles, which is, everybody is very confused initially about that. It's like, you're doing a legal history of textiles. That's really not something that's a thing. Um, but in fact, textiles are this really interesting, unique form of property because it comes with this presumption that the clothing that people wear belongs to the wearer. And, you know, it, it gets down, you don't want the shirt back. You don't want people running around stark naked, right? So clothes belong to the people who are that, that they're on. And so this then produces a whole series of legal practices and principles that allow people who lack property rights to own clothing, but then those people extend that out to mean well, cloth and bed linens and accessories and, well, the things that I make that are textiles and, well, then also anything that's sort of related to textiles that passes through my hands. So there's this whole piece of the economy and the legal system that opens up based around these principles that people are really pushing and extending and using um, in the period between the revolution and the civil war in really creative ways. And they're not only using these principles, they're demanding recognition for them in the courts as well. So they march down to local courts and insist that those courts recognize their claims to clothing and their disputes over textiles more generally. Now you might think, oh, well, they're just cloth and clothing. That's just nothing. And these days, you know, we think about clothing as, you know, some people go buy it and then they don't even wash it. They just throw it away. It's so cheap. Um, but this time it's really valuable. Um, so, you know, if you think back, um, merchants in this period are making absolute fortunes, trading textiles of all kinds all over the, in the global economy. And you know, a coat for a man, a nice coat would cost a year's wages and a dress for a woman could cost even more. So these are really valuable pieces of property. And they're really valuable for their economics, but not just for their economics. What makes them valuable for people on the margins without property rights or with weak claims to property rights is that law secures this property to them. The value of this property is about law. Um, and it is about the ways that these people in this period, people on the margins who we've assumed to be outside law and economy are actually using textiles to move themselves inside governing institutions and inside the economy in this period period. Um, and then what I really like about textiles is they're never just utilitarian. Um, they're also beautiful and they're meaningful in ways that go beyond just their economic value. Um, and so people really care a lot about what they're wearing. The details are really meaningful to them. They take real pride in putting those things together into beautiful outfits. They take great pride in making them. Um, so this is also about people's connections to material goods that bring real joy to their lives. And to me, this opened up new elements of people in this period. So instead of just sort of victimized folks in the margin who are always trod upon and live these dreary lives, Instead, I had these people who all of a sudden became more human. Um, they have joy in their life. They have a good sense of, hu of humor. And they have this creativity and real resilience as they're moving through really difficult, difficult circumstances. And yet they do something more than simply get by. They make joy and beauty in their lives. It's so, uh, this is so apparent in the story that you tell. I must say it's extraordinarily rich work. The sources are so fantastic. And we're gonna delve down into some of this as we go forward because I really want you to share some of these stories with the audience because they're, they're really remarkable. Before I do that though, I wanted to just stop for a moment and, and ask you to expound a little bit on a little, little statement you make in the acknowledgement. You say, <laughs> I began writing this book before I knew I was writing it. Textiles have always distracted me. What do you mean by that? How, how did textiles distract you and how did they get you to write this book? So I've always loved 
textiles, cloth and clothing. So when I was three years old, I would sit across from my mother who sewed my clothes and she would give me the scraps. And then I would take them and cut little armholes in them for my stuffed rabbit. And I was really very bad at the beginning and the armholes would be like uneven, but I got better over time as I can draw a straight line. And then I tied it in the back with string. And then over time I got my own little sewing machine and I made better clothes for my stuffed rabbit and for various dolls. <laughs> and I, so I grew up doing sewing and stitching and needlework of all kinds. And what really fascinated me as a child was that you could make something out of not nothing, but this flat thing, and you could turn it into something that was really, you could wear it. It was amazing to me. Um, so I still sew. I sewed my outfit tonight. Um, oh, I love it. <laughs> so and my sewing class, I invited them. So they may be out there. Hi. Um, so I did. So this is a part of my life that, that I've just, just always been there. I can't recall a time when that wasn't interesting to me. And so I realized when I was doing this, when I started, you know, as a dissertation student in graduate school, I took notes on clothing and I didn't really realize I was doing that. And so whenever somebody would talk about it, I would just take notes on it. And I realized over time that I had all this stacks of notes that were from like, they're 25 years old. And apparently I had been sort of sorting through these ideas for a very long time, but I think it goes back to me at three years old with my mother at the sewing machine. I love that. And it does speak to something that um, is so important about scholarship, mm -hmm. the way that certain ideas percolate yeah. for years. Oh yeah. Um, and you can see in this work, I mean, I'm, I'm a great fan of your of your scholarship. You can see in it all all of those points along the way, um, sort of pulled through again. Kind of the fabric of your of your um, oeuvre is it's here, and you can see it there. And I I love that. It's wonderful for students of history to to know that that's how it can happen, mm -hmm. um, and that it can be rooted really deep in in us. So I thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm a knitter. Um, and uh, and also, it is a miracle to see something mm -hmm. so beautiful come out of just that little hand work, right? No, exactly. Yeah. So I, I, I feel like that experience also helped me understand why this is meaningful to people. I feel like people yes. who don't do this kind of thing, just they don't appreciate the work and the labor and yeah. the creativity that goes into it, right? I think that's a, so also very evident, the degree to which you're paying attention, not just to the consumption of these goods, but the creation of them. And right. that's another whole very important element of this that's gendered in all kinds of interesting ways is we're gonna hopefully touch on in a minute. Um, you say uh, in the book that textiles are different than other kinds of property in that quote, their legal qualities derived primarily from the realm of practice, not the pages of the statutes, appellate opinions, or treatises. You cite as an example of this, the quote, bits of fabric attached to the files of infants left at London's Foundling Hospital in the 18th century. And I think Catherine is gonna help us to pop up a Im this image, it's figure one one in your book. Could you tell us a little bit more about what we're seeing in this image? And then also, how does this connect to the larger question of textiles legal force, especially where women were concerned? Yes, this comes from an exhibit that John Stiles, an English historian, did in um, a few years back with the London Foundling Hospital, which is now actually still in existence. It's called Coram, and they were very kind to let me use this image. Um, but mothers with children whom they couldn't care for would drop them at the Foundling Hospital, which took in orphans. But in order to identify the mother and place it with the child, in case the mother came back to claim the child later, they would leave tokens. And the tokens were often cut from either the child's clothing or the mother's clothing. I find this haunting beyond belief, right? So how would you recognize a child three years later, right? A newborn three years, you, you wouldn't necessarily be able to track it that way. Um, and the you know, people are illiterate. The records would be difficult to do 
that way is, but the token would be the thing that connected the mother to the child. And the token comes from their clothing. And you can see from these tokens, as John Stiles points out, the, the care often that these mothers already had for their children, the love that's involved. So, I mean, this is, you know, a piece of red flannel that's cut out in the shape of a heart. Um, there's, you know, things that are cut beautiful, like designs of dress of calicos and cottons that, that, you know, they had, mothers had spent money on, even though they're going to give the child away and cannot take care of the child. Um, but those become the tokens that attach the mother to the child. And you would think, oh, well, this is just sentimental, right? But this actually has legal meaning, right? This is how legally a mother can reclaim that child. And so through practice, this idea that clothes belong to the person who wears them, um, that happens with both sides here, the clothing of the child, the clothing of the mother, and that's what actually bonds these two people together. And it's that kind of connection that people then use to elaborate in all kinds of ways to claim goods that may might otherwise not have a claim to. I mean, in this instance, there are mothers actually claiming children. But I use another example, a story from the book is Polly, who's an enslaved woman in South Carolina. And she's spinning thread and she dyes the thread. She leaves it out to dry um, after she dyes the thread and somebody steals it. And so she goes down, she complains about it being stolen. And you think, well, how can this be stolen? She's enslaved and she can't own any property, right? But it's about using these kinds of connections of making the claims over and over and over again. So enslaved women, enslaved men, married women, poor people repeatedly made claims that no, 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 this clothing is mine. No, 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 this thread that I spun is mine. And so when Polly makes those claims, there is a place for it to land because they have been made over and over and over and over again to the point where it's really difficult to deny them. Um, and in this instance, we have a case where we're adjudicating the theft of this enslaved woman's thread. And ultimately they restore the thread to her because it belongs to her, not because she has property rights to it, but because it belongs to her because she made it, because everybody saw her made it, because it was connected to her, and therefore it is hers. But these aren't the kind of things that you point to a statute and say, see, there it is. It's written down in law. It's something that you have to use again and again, and you create through practice. And in law, you know, it's, it's custom, which is recognized in this period. So it acquires legal force that way, but only through continual use. So in essence, people like Polly were making law, and we don't usually see them that way. And I find that really interesting. Yeah, I think this is so, um, I, I'm quite sure that most people uh, in the audience, many people in the audience will be surprised to hear this, right? right. Um, the idea is absolutely that, that how, could, how could enslaved people or married women under the laws of coverture, how, how do they have any claim to something's being stolen from them when they have no property rights? But this right. is really at the heart of your argument, right? That the book is interested in the ways that people with weak claims to rights under the law um, in the early Republic, that's free white women, enslaved and free black men and women and the poor, nonetheless, were able to establish and defend claims to textiles. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a presumption you say that people have this right. Um, how is this so? And I, I think some of it has to do with this difference between what you'd call public and private law. Right, right, right. No, exactly. can, can you explain that a little bit to people so they understand the difference and help us understand how this works in terms of time? Because we're looking at a very particular set of years, right? Just the po immediate post-revolution into around 1830, where this is operative in the American context, though it's borrowing from colonial practice and obviously European practice too. Right, so we're talking about a period in US history where you have many jurisdictions which are not clearly defined, right? So you, you have a federal jurisdiction which actually doesn't deal with a whole lot of kinds of legal issues at this point, it deals with federal cases of which there are very few. And certainly the people we're talking about here um, 
aren't usually involved in federal cases. That becomes a little different later when enslaved people use federal law to try to challenge slavery when they move across state lines. Then you have state cases, and then states though delegate a lot of authority to local areas. And local areas you know, tend to this area called public law, which deals with all kinds of manner of things dealing with the public order, everything dealing with the public order, which is like broad and ambiguous, right? It's like somebody's stinky latrine, should we build a mill here? We have these disputes with these other people who don't like each other and keep hitting on one another. Um, we have a social welfare, which is about taking care of the sick and the poor and the orphaned. But there's this whole range of issues around the public order that you, know, you can resolve not around the claims to rights, but about the claim of upholding customary practice. And textiles fit in really well with claims to the public order because they are customary practices and something that entire businesses um, are built around, right? So the economy kind of depends on these customary practices. If you think about it, for instance, most of the people who are buying textiles from merchants are actually people without property rights, like married women, right? Um, also enslaved people buy property uh, textiles themselves from merchants. Um, and then poor people buy a lot of textiles as well. So like merchants really depend on the customary practices that enable all of these people without property rights to claim this kind of property and purchase this kind of property. Um, so what you do then, instead of claiming your textiles as my property right, that would go into an area called what we associate with civil suits now, property rights. Uh, you would take it into the area of public law, where you would not say my rights are violated, but you say the public order has been violated because somebody took property away from the person to whom it belonged. So you could put that property back to where it belongs, give it back to the person who claimed it without affirming property rights. So this is kind of interesting in a lot of ways because you're saying, oh, actually then all of these people who we think are sort of outside the law are creating law, creating customary practices and which become legal principles in those areas. And they're then actually defining like how the public order works and that public order yeah. recognizes their property claims. The downside is that these are, these are adjudicated, adjudicated through the charges of theft which makes this property claims appear over time more illegitimate, right? Because in Polly's case, for instance, she gets her thread back. The person who stole it was actually trying to settle a debt with her husband. So he takes her thread in order to settle the debt with her husband. There's all sorts of things wrong with that because it's her thread, not her husband's thread. But nonetheless, you could see he has a, he has a point here. He gets charged. When, when she gets her thread back, he becomes a criminal and is punished physically. Whereas if this had been in the civil side, in a civil case, it would be a debt case. And he would simply, you know, she would get the thread and he would have, you know, monetary penalties, but he wouldn't be a criminal. So the problem here is that there's the good thing is that they can like claim property through these kinds of cases. But the bad thing is that over time, it tends to undermine their claims to property too. Yeah, this is, it, there are lots of ironies in, in this, and it seems like one of the most interesting elements of having the ability to make these claims is that there's an immediate recognition of someone being wronged and reestablishing the mm -hmm. peace or the order right. of the community, but there's nothing about that that's about precedent where the person's concerned. It's exactly. a totally one-off this instant, this totally specific context. It's yeah. not, as you say, it doesn't translate. It doesn't begin to carry across jurisdictions or situations in any way, right? Right, and this is another downside, right? Because you're upholding mm -hmm. customary practices in a particular place for a particular person. So Polly in upcountry South Carolina with her thread, everybody knows it's her thread. But if she were to go to North Carolina and she's walking around with thread, it's like, we don't know if it's her thread anymore because the whole context which made it hers is gone. All the people who know her, all the people who saw her make the thread, all the people who can attach the thread to her. So this is very particular and it stays in one place. And you can see also here the problems that um, all these people who own property in this way are rooted in place. They can't expand their businesses. So um, 
there's another woman and another example of a woman I use who's a she's a married woman. She lives in Virginia, sort of nearby Charlottesville. And she has a whole business where she is selling textiles and making textiles. And she has a real, and Dunn and Bradstreet, a credit reporting firm, um, still in existence, um, reports on her and she has great credit. But the problem is it's local credit. It, it can only be, she can only own property there. She couldn't get credit and then expand her business out like men whose property claims travel because they have property rights, which are recognized across jurisdictions. So this really limits people too, which is unfortunate, right? Um, Absolutely. And, and, and it does seem like this question of credit, there's a credit, there's sort of our customary understanding of credit, which is about who knows you this is a face-to-face -face society in general right. credit there even the Dun and Bradstreet are going around and talking to people about well, does this one have good credit or not so right. there's something deeply social about it but this is 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 much more restrictive for women right. and poor people and free and enslaved people of color right exactly, exactly. Um, so, yeah and I think one, if maybe we could just step back for a quick second, because, and we're talking about married women's right to property, I think we should stop for a moment and talk a little bit about coverture. Um, because one of the things you help us understand is the way that Blackstone's commentaries end up creating a whole set of ideas about women's right to property that in fact are much more restrictive in the early 19th century United States context than they were elsewhere and in other times. Could you build that out a little bit? Sure. Um, so for those of you who are not up in your 19th century history, so Sir William Blackstone, who is writing about, he's, he's trying to condense the common law and to summarize this. And he's English, he's Sir William Blackstone, but he becomes very popular in the late 18th century, early 19th century amongst legal professionals in the United States. And he's the one that we quote most often on coverture. And coverture is a series of principles that submerge women's identity, in, legal identity into that of their husbands. And so that not only sort of erases legal women's, married women's legal identities, but it also moves their property that they own before marriage and anything they earned after marriage, it turns that into their husband's property. It also makes it impossible for them to contract in their own names. Um, it also makes it impossible for them to prosecute cases in their own names, right? So, Blackstone, though, takes what were kind of, th that's Blackstone's vision of coverture. Before Blackstone, coverture was not a thing. It was a series of scattered principles in the way that the early modern mind worked, which is pre-Jefferson counting everything and mushing it all together and making, you know, putting it in, in an organized framework. This is like, well, you have a principle over here that says that a woman's property is her husband's, but you got a principle over here that says that, you know, women can keep textiles and both of those things can be true at the same time. And the one modified the other. When you get Blackstone, it starts elbowing out all of those other principles that modified some of the limitations of coverture and really narrowed down what women could do. That said, that takes a long time for that to happen. We sort of presume that things were worse in the past and things got easier, more flexible and opened up for women over time. And that's actually not really very historically accurate. So in this period, you have one vision of law that is pretty rigid that is moving into, um, it's become very popular amongst legal professionals and is moving into statutes, appellate cases, and is starting to define women's status. But you still have the women out there saying, no, we get to own textiles. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. You don't understand. So they keep using these other legal principles that are unwritten that conflict with this Blackstonian version. And so you get people like Amanda Cooley, and we have a picture of her. Yeah. Maybe we can pull that up. Um, so the Cooleys live in Western Virginia. And they, they're sort of at that corner of Tennessee, North Carolina, um, Virginia. And this is Amanda Cooley. She is as a couple sisters, you'll notice she has a beautiful dress on. Her mother has a textile business. So they weave together like thousands of yards of cloth. They also do sewing for the community. One of the things they do is make the men's militia coats that they use for militia musters. And 
there isn't really a uniform. They just make really fancy coats with like lots of braid and trim and colors. And all the guys go out there looking really sharp. So they're very busy before a militia muster. Um, and they keep what they make. Right. So the fact that they're producing textiles and this is really they have a manufacturing in a 19th century sense, which is a place that produces a lot of goods for sale. Um, and what they do is they go into town and trade in their own names. And the merchants in town know that they can trade in their own names because they know the coolie women. And so they go in and what do they buy? They buy more textiles. And why do they buy textiles? Because they're trading their, you know, woolens that they weave for fine silks and the kinds of really pretty trimmings that you see on her dress there. Um, so what they're doing is investing, actually, because if they go buy other forms of property, that property might move to the husband's side of the ledger. And what they're doing is keeping their property separate by investing in textiles. And this becomes really important for one of the daughters whose husband's is rather feckless. They move to Missouri, his farm fails, but what she has is a trousseau that she has built up with, you know, under her mother's tutelage that is full of, you know, textiles, of bed linens, of nice fabrics. And those are the kinds of things that will actually keep her and her family afloat because that's her property and it can't be seized by her husband's creditors. Um, and so you start thinking about why they're buying these textiles in a different way. It's not just, oh, they're buying pretty consumer items. They're actually investing and keeping their property separate, but also often using it to help support their families too. And so I really like these coolie women. They're very interesting. They're fascinating. It's a great story. I mean, you pick them up a couple of times and we get um, new little bits of their story throughout. It's really incredibly rich and very lucky to find the sources there they, that they like to go a trading. Yes, I like that. I love that. They, they go a trading. They go to uh, town a trading. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, this leads me to another wonderful, I, I, let me just tell the audience that Laura's a great writer and there are funny, humorous stories and lovely turns of phrase throughout the book. So um, one of the, one of them is uh, a, a sentence that says, a handkerchief was more than something to blow your nose with. It was also a dollar bill, an investment, and a business venture. And so I think we kind of got a taste of the investment and business venture there with the Cooley right. story, but how did textiles act as currency? And, and we might want to pull up here um, figure five, four. Right. You know, this is something that it took me a long time to figure out what was going on because like people were constantly trading with textiles. So for instance, there is a great story with the, the Pennsylvania Prison Society and they yeah, want all funny. of the prisoners, these are a bunch of Quakers and they're very insistent that the prisoners in Philadelphia prison, jail are well-dressed. And so they can't walk around in tattered clothes and whatnot. This is terrible. If you walk around in tattered clothes, it means that your, your character is problematic. And there's this sort of notion here that your clothes are revealing of your character. And that's part of this idea that the clothes belong to you. They're, they express something about you personally. Weirdly, that connection that is a personal connection that allows people to alienate that property because since it is personal, it is theirs. Aha. And that's why I can also give it away. So the prison society hands out clothes to these people who are, you know, imprisoned. And some of these are just they're vagrants, they're they're people who are on hard times. They're these are not like mass murderers and whatnot. So they hand clothes, and then when they walk into the jail, everybody else strips them down, and then they spend it on alcohol or, you know, at the local tavern. And it's like, this is really hard to figure out what to do, because on the one hand, we want them well-dressed. On the other hand, they keep selling their clothes. Oh, my gosh, this is terrible. And I'm like, so why are they selling? They're bartering their clothes for alcohol? I don't get this. But then I started looking at how people are actually exchanging these things. And what they do is they value them in shillings, pounds and shillings first, because that was the, what the standard unit of account, the account through by which you value things, the unit you value things, used to value things, and then use that as the means of exchanging unlike things. So if you value a piece of cheese as a dollar and the handkerchief as a dollar, you know that it's a similar value and you can exchange it, right? It's Otherwise, it's a piece of cheese and a handkerchief and they're incommensurable. So they value this in terms of pounds and shillings or dollars and cents. And then they're exchanging these things. And I'm like, oh, 
that's not barter, that's currency, right? And then you start looking at it and it's just fairly routine. Um, like a handkerchief is kind of a dollar and then you discount it according to use, right? If it's like a dirty handkerchief, it will knock off 25 cents. If it's a silk <laughs> handkerchief, you know, you add on some dollars and if it's a pretty color, you might, you know, get some more money for that. But people know all of the textiles well enough that they can do that really quickly. So you see them rattling off all these details about, no, 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 it was a nice dress and the trim, but it had kind of wear on the bottom. And what they're doing is they're, they're assessing value there um, right. and economic right. value so that they can trade that. So they know how much that's worth so they can trade it for something else. So I'm thinking, well, this is just because they're poor, right? And it's like, yes and no. And this banknote, this is a, a this is a cartoon that underscores the problem with banknotes and the monetary system generally in this period. So banknotes are issued by local banks, state banks, the US government, and they fluctuate wildly in value. And so Seth Brockman has a lovely anecdote in his book about how um, People would be promised, laborers would be promised to be paid in banknotes at the beginning of the week. And by the end of the week, the banknotes would be worthless. Because, and then you also have a banknote issued in Philadelphia, and nobody will take it in Charleston because the further you get away from the point of issue, the less valuable it is. So, this is all about how awful banknotes are, that they don't hold their value, that you can't trust them, that this is really bad. But actually textiles hold their value far more reliably. So you look at a handkerchief and you know what it is. You look at a banknote and it's like, you don't know what it is. Um, there are court cases where banknotes are stolen in New York City and they'll say, this is a banknote denominated at $5 worth five cents. Right. This is another banknote denominated $10 worth unknown because you just don't know, right? So whatever's the face value, you have no clue. You can look at the banknote all day and you never figure out how much it's worth, but you can look at a handkerchief and you can know. So this is a reliable form of currency. And it also comes in a variety of shapes and values. So like if you are trading a watch and you want to go buy you know, a piece of cheese, it's not going to work because nobody can make change but you can cut a piece of cloth down, right? You can have a handkerchief, you can pay two handkerchiefs, you can pay a shirt, which is more, you can pay a length of cloth. Um, so it also works, it's more flexible. And when poor people, enslaved people and women have clothing, it's not suspicious or textiles. Right. But when they have banknotes, it is because it's a form of property that is likely not theirs to spend, right? So it's probably stolen. And even if it's not stolen, it by law might belong to their husbands or their masters. And so people are unwilling or less willing to trade with people without property rights when they have banknotes and coins, but they will take clothing. Uh, which this is, is so fascinating, right? The idea that all of this trade in textiles is in fact money. Yes. And, and the way we have, we've always understood there were petty markets among enslaved communities and things like that, but this is much, much more lively, kind of up and down a kind of set of status ranks mm -hmm. where this money is flowing and allowing uh, economic activity to happen to capital accumulation to happen in the form of fabric, right. which is just revelatory to me. Um, and um, I love the way you describe that, you know, you can cut down the, the value of the handkerchief by how much it's used, but also literally cut, cut the cloth right. uh, to have it be what you need it to be, right? That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, there, you, you do begin, you know, you help us see how this is operating around the uh, turn of the century and in the early Republic. But by the 1830s and 40s, there's a shift that's taking place. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a shift that is largely happening in law that begins to diminish the value of textiles in the capacity that we've just been discussing. And um, this shift is signaling big changes in the way that the social order is conceived, regulated and enforced overall. So, can you walk us through this shift and why is it significant for us to know that that happens and what does it mean for the history of the United States and say the middle part of the century by the time we get to the Civil War? 
Yeah, you know, I this was really hard for me to wrap my mind around. And so at first I'm thinking, you know, you hit the 1830s and many of you out there in Zoom land might be thinking, oh, well, we have like all of these factories now that are producing goods and, you know, they're churning them out. And this is true. And this happens particularly for cottons, um, but it's less so with other kinds of Fibers. So, you know, silk and linen and wool is still, a lot of that's still done by hand, but all this turning out of cottons reduces the price of everything, essentially. Um, and so you see prices going way down. And so I'm thinking, well, textiles are getting less valuable because of the economics alone. And I'm like struggling because it's like, but wait a minute, what, where's the legal part? Of I don't understand. It's not quite working out. I don't understand how this, it's only economics. So it's just because they're cheaper, is this the problem? And then I realized, no, it's also, there's a legal component here in the sense that as these things get cheaper and cheaper, people start stealing, they start stealing large amounts of them. And then they also start sort of undermining the rules of the trade. And there are real rules that people recognize um, about how you trade goods when you don't have property rights. Um, and to give you an example, there's a trunk. And I, there were tons of trunks. Uh, there was trunks everywhere in my research. I didn't know what they were about. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, a trunk is a legal container. So if you are a servant in somebody else's house, if you're an enslaved person, if you're a married woman whose the belongings are presumed to belong to the person who owns the house, if you put your belongings and your textiles in a trunk, that is recognized as cordoning off your property, right? So, and the rules about a trunk. So if the lid is open, you haven't reduced the property to your possession because the lid is open and anybody can come take that out. If you close the lid and you lock it, you've reduced that property to your possession. That's yours, it's locked. And so if somebody finds somebody else's property in that trunk and it's locked, that's theft because you've locked it and made it impossible for them to get it back out. If the lid is closed, but not locked, we're in a gray area because it depends because you could open it, but maybe you wouldn't open it. So that requires some explanation, some adjudication. Um, and there are other rules too about, you know, you agree on a length of a loan and you do this verbally, but then, you know, I, I loan you a sheet. And we have an example in the book of a sheet, you know, that a woman has a sheet, she loans it and then she doesn't get it back. And clearly the person who has borrowed the sheet has violated the terms of that loan. And she's really upset and she goes and grabs a sheet. And then, and then after she gets the sheet, she goes down and files charges of theft, even though she still has a sheet now, um, because the rules have been violated. Um, you need to follow the rules, right? So you start getting the people who are violating the rules and then going in and claiming, you know, that it's their property, but it's very clear that it's theft, that they're these theft rings, that this is robbery. Um, and all of this starts undermining kind of the legitimacy of the rules themselves, right? As more and more people violate them um, and try to justify what they're doing in terms of rules that in fact they're violating, it tends to undermine everything. And then at the same time, you have increasingly people in the legal community emphasizing rights as the means that you need to possess property, that there is no other way to possess property. It is only through rights. And so all of these other kinds of ways of owning property start falling out. They don't fall out. They just never get recorded in the written legal documents, which are increasingly defining what the law is. And so right. they're not visible in writing. And therefore, people now like don't think they exist. You have to go back and piece them together through practice. But they don't exist in the written documents about what the law is. So legal professionals are focusing on property rights. They start expanding also that out into the actual process. So mm -hmm. a legal process that used to be about bringing in your sheet and your clothing and your neighbors and talking about who owned what, all of that starts to be reconfigured in a way that makes that kind of evidence impossible to bring into court. So it becomes harder and harder for people to make these kinds of claims, the process and the legal system itself changes. So it shifts away from the kind of oral testimony, the kind of customary practice and starts making that look problematic at the same time that you have all these other people sort of undermining this by basically violating the rules as well. Right, and, and so and, we, we, oh, go ahead. When they can violate the rules because nobody's like, 
enforcing the rules in quite the way, the courts aren't enforcing the rules in quite the way they want right. to do. Right, and that this new cadre of professionalized lawyers right. is just, un, if, if interested or even aware of this practice-based legal principle, um, ceases to be conversant in it or decides right. that it's totally illegitimate. And suddenly that little space that had existed just becomes increasingly constricted and right. begins to sort of die on the vine. And it seems to me that um, the, the, I mean, the huge irony here, of course, is that we think of the Civil War and Reconstruction as this era in which rights expand in this new way and that this is, this is you know, the thing we talk about. But what you're suggesting is that for people who are on the margins, the distance between um, that marginal place and rights grows. Right. It doesn't collapse. It in fact is growing and getting bigger. Um, and you say, while men entered the post-Civil War era with rights, at least in theory, and of course we understand the ways that those rights were contested and um, all in all kinds of ways violated. Nonetheless, women were left with only the clothes on their backs which by then had become flimsy legal coverings. And I think that the stories you end the book with about the intertwined stories of Mary Todd Lincoln and Elizabeth Keckley are particularly illustrative of, of this. And um, maybe you could just explain that story to the audience. Yeah, you know, we always think of the Civil War era, Reconstruction Amendments as extending out these rights. And they're good reason for people to want rights. You can move across state lines. It's, it's, it's secure in a lot of ways. But the problem is that those amendments don't extend rights to married women or women more generally, in fact. And so Elizabeth Keckley, who's featured here, she's a seamstress. Actually, that's understating what she does. She's a modiste. Yeah. She's a designer. Um, she would be a designer today, you know. Uh, um, so she makes and designs clothing. And one of her chief clients was Mary Todd Lincoln. And Mary Todd Lincoln, uh, Elizabeth Keckley had designed this amazing wardrobe for her. Mary Todd Lincoln's wardrobe, it's purported to be, have been worth somewhere between $20,000 and $70,000 now. Um, it was a huge amount of money that was invested in these clothes, right? And so this is, this is really important. And it has value partly because of the way that Elizabeth Keckley had designed these clothes, right? So long story short, Lincoln's will when he was shot um, was a mess and his estate was a mess and Mary Todd had nothing to live on. So she determined that she was going to sell her clothes, which is exactly what like women have been doing for centuries, in fact. And there's a big um, there's a tradition of doing this in Europe where, you know, um, the, the aristocracy women would sell clothing and then it, it, it's, it was established practice and it, it is commonplace. It is what women did throughout my entire book. And everybody gets amazingly upset at this point though, that Mary Todd Lincoln would sell her clothes. And all of this is about sort of like she's selling herself. It becomes this sort of, it, it goes back and forth really, really easily between her clothing and her. Her clothes are in poor shape. So Mary Todd Lincoln's a bad character. And they're always sort of like, there's these analogies to slavery. And I'm like, this is weird. But what's happening is that those clothes were stripped of their legal value at this point. And so they are seen as just clothes. It's just this outer covering of her as a personal expression of her and to sell her and her clothes are all bound up together. And this is seen as something that's really scandalous and really problematic, partly because she is also the president's wife. But this is, but this is part of this larger transformation where clothes become just clothes and not, you know, don't have these legal meanings where they're valuable property. And what's really sad here is that Elizabeth Keckley just gets erased in terms of all of the labor, all of the creativity, everything that she put into that. She never really works again as a modiste. Her whole livelihood is stripped away because everything that she's made has been ridiculed here. But you also get a sense of what's happening to these women and their ability to leverage their labor into something that is sort of a more meaningful life because the legal qualities that made those garments valuable starts going away. And it's not just the economics here. It is also the way that the law has changed to turn them into something that isn't quite so meaningful anymore. Thanks, that's, that's really, it's really remarkable. And it's such a story um, to, to imagine Keckley who, 
came out of slavery and established herself with this set of skills that were remarkable and then is uh, impoverished in the end of end of that story. It's a heartbreaking one, actually. No, she actually buys her way out of slavery because of her right. skills as a seamstress. And then in the end, all of that is destroyed. And this isn't just Lincoln. It isn't just, the, it, it is also a changing legal world that leaves women, white and black, rich and poor, in a very vulnerable position without the legal qualities of clothing anymore. And then also without rights either. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's turn to a few questions from our audience, shall we? I'm gonna look here. I'm Forgive me folks, I'm looking in the Q&A. Um, oh, Margaret Collarelli asks, was the notion of a person's ownership of textiles they made related in any way to Locke's concept in his second treatise of government that defines property as that in which a person has mixed his or her labor. Yes and no. Women mix their labor to make all kinds of property, but they don't have claims to it. But with textiles, yes, that really matters because you already have the presumption that clothing belongs to you. And so the idea that you have mixed your labor and created this then adds to that and becomes a really kind of strong, moves it in that more in that direction, right? So people are using that concept, but they're able to do that with textiles much more so than with other things, actually. And Margaret followed up with another question, is jewelry considered women's property? You have an interesting comment about that or two in the book. Yeah, yeah, it is part of their paraphernalia, which is recognized clothing, jewelry. That is one thing that is recognized in um, even Blackstone recognizes this, although this sort of falls away actually in US legal treatises and written law. Um, jewelry is, but sometimes jewelry is not as valuable as the clothing. Um, you know, if you go through estates, what's the most valuable thing usually in many households is the beddings and the bed linens. And by bedding, they don't mean the furniture, they mean the bedding, the linens itself. And the same thing with, you know, dresses and, and other forms of textiles. Um, so yeah, jewelry, not always the most expensive thing. And then jewelry is also harder to deal with because if it is expensive, then you can't trade it as easily actually. And it's also really dangerous for poor people and enslaved people to have. Right, because like they can be suspected of, of theft, correct? Theft, right, so an enslaved person yeah. with a watch would sometimes paint it brown so that it wouldn't be noticeable silver or gold, for instance. Um, we have a question from Mariah Gruner and she says, would women working in textiles mills in New England in the first half of the 19th century have been wearing clothes made by the mills? How did these legal customs and constructs shift in the context of the factory town where the workers are thought to reflect upon the mill owners and whose domestic context are increasingly owned by the mill owners? Yeah, no, um, I have some really interesting women who work in the Lowell mills and what they do is they turn their wages into textiles. It's sort of like the Cooley women. So um, they get their wages and then they buy textiles in the mill town where they get good deals. And then they go home and they sell them at a higher price. I find this hysterical. So, you know, they're, they're, they're doing what the Cooley women did, but they're, they're leveraging this. And they have all these like letters back and forth about don't cut the cloth because if you cut the cloth, it's, you know, 10 yards. If you cut it in half, it's worth less, but don't tell our friends how much we bought it for because then they'll want a discount. <laughs> so they're, um, they're doing what women have done, which is taking the meager earnings that they have and like nobody's getting rich here, but they're taking that and leveraging it by buying more textiles and then selling it themselves, which is also part of this larger market where these people will buy these goods and then turn them into, you know, currency and capital and, and whatnot themselves, which just drives the merchants absolutely bats. That's, that's a fantastic story. Um, we have another one, this from Cecile Margulis, who says, was there a time when clothing could be returned to the former owner? such as royalty giving clothing as a gift, could that clothing revert back to the royal if he asked for it, or perhaps any person who was wealthy or a person of privilege? It's a really good question. And actually in you know, Europe, continental Europe, England, servants and servants included categories that we would now call wage workers were often paid in clothing. So the presumption again is really strong that no, that belongs to you. And in fact, there are these cases um, in New York City that parallel some of that from you know, 
centuries past where servants would have livery and then their employer didn't pay them. And so they took the livery instead. And the court lets them keep the livery because they're owed their wages, right? But the, the clothing was often wages. And so usually, yeah, there is no like, no, we don't want it back. And sometimes when the employer or the, the wealthy person, the, the restaurant would, would claim it back, the servants would have a very strong claim for, no, this is mine, not yours, because the presumption went heavily in that direction. But you would see complaints. It's like, she took you know some of my clothing too, or she took clothing that I gave to her. And it's like, well, there are always going to be conflicts there. But in this one instance, you know the people who were at the lower social scale had good good reason and ability and legal ability to claim that that particular property, that clothing. That's that's great. We have I think we have one time for one more and I'm going to just check here. Um, Laura Ping asks, would a dress that had been made over lose value even if it had been updated to reflect current fashion? That's a good question. So fashion goes kind of slowly in this period. So, and what people did with a dress is they would keep the silhouette, but then change out the trimmings. So you would make it last for quite a while. You got probably 10 years on that. Um, so what you're looking for is wear. And the wear really matters more than the style. So if it's like, it's a good house now, right? You see it has good bones and a dress would have good bones. And then you could alter some of the trimmings and whatnot. The problem would be if it's really worn. So even then though, you might, if you could look, you could turn it inside out, you could remake it. So you're always looking for that. You're, you're discounting it depending on what you think, how much more use you can get out of it. Um, and the use would be wear, but the use would also be trading, right? And so the trading tends to be about the wear rather than the fashion per se. Although, you know, it mattered. The fashion part mattered. That's great. Thanks so much, Laura. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Laura and Margaret, thank you both so much. I'm still, I'm still kind of struggling over the, uh, the closed but unlocked trunk, but I guess we'll, we'll just have to, uh, we'll have to read the book to, uh, to dig deeper into, into the controversies over that one. It's really, it's a pleasure to have both of you here at the Newberry tonight. Um, Laura, congratulations on the book. Um, and Margaret, thanks for your wonderful questions and for, for moderating this evening. Thank you, Margaret. It's always so fun to talk to you. And thank you, Dan. Oh, likewise. Absolutely my pleasure and privilege. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, a recording of this program will be available on the Newberry's YouTube channel soon. Newberry programs remain free and open to the public thanks to the generosity of our donors. During this critical time, we need the support of the entire community. So please support the Newberry Library by making a gift today. You can do that online at newberry.org give. I also invite you to join us for our next in-person program at the Newberry on Thursday, March 3rd at 6 p.m. when Claire M.L. Bourne will speak on Shakespeare in type for this year's Wing Foundation lecture on the history of the book. And again, that's an in-person program at the Newberry, March 3rd at 6 p.m. You can join our mailing list to be the first to hear about upcoming programs and other Newberry news. You can also sign up for the mailing list at newberry.org. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Good night.